Hey, everybody. I want to introduce you today to Chef Tony Biggs. He is the Director of Culinary Arts at Certified Angus Beef, but I like to think of him more of as an entertainer. So I've seen pictures on Instagram where he's holding. <laughs> See, there it is. <laughs> One minion coming up. Um, I've seen pictures on Instagram where he's got maybe 12 steaks impaled on a pitchfork and live fires going on as he's doing grilling events. So he just, he's a good one for us to talk to. He's been on TV and I have no doubt he's got lots of really great stories to share. So we're just going to dive right in. And Tony, I am excited to welcome you to this episode of Postcards from the Kitchen. Elaine, thank you very much. I, it's an honor to be here. Um, can't wait to get going here, but uh, I really appreciate you having me on this podcast. That'll be fun. All right. So I know you've had this lively career. So let's kick it off with something kind of fun. So maybe tell me a story about a time when you did something really crazy. And this may be something you do every day, but really crazy. <laughs> well, you, you know, of? I was thinking about it and um, I think one of, you know, there's been so many. There's, I think in my career, it's it started when I was just a, you know, dishwasher in a seafood house outside of Boston, um, you know, until, you know, it, it's been just a, such a long journey. And along those journeys, there's been stories and, and different things. But I, I would have to say that a couple of years ago, uh, Certified Angus Beef, we had our annual conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And we took over the whole street, the whole main street. And I cooked two six foot paellas in the middle of downtown Nashville. And everybody, I mean, everybody, I mean, this was for our guests, but it was roped off. But all these, you know, all these other folks came who were visiting Nashville and they thought they could just come up and buy you know, a plate of paella for five bucks, I had to shoo them away. It was like, no, no, this is a private party. This is a private party. Please, please. No, no, no. But everybody, I mean, there was hundreds of people like around me watching me to do this. And so, uh, you know, the culinary entertainer that I'm trying to be or am, I made it like really entertaining. So I started, hey, a little bit of this. So we have a little bit of that. And Let's throw in the uh, bomba rice and the uh, chorizo, and um, thank God I didn't flame it, you know, because I think that would have, that that would have been like over the top, and I would have had it would have been a Greek dish instead of really a Spanish dish. So I think that was one of them. Yeah, that's one of them. That's fun, and it just proves food brings people together, whether they know you or not. That's. <laughs> it, it brings you together and you know it is like the universal language of love I truly believe that you know it, I've worked all around the world and all these different countries and to break bread with folks you know um, eating sushi in Japan or you know Shrek bread in the Middle East meeting new folks it's just it's one of those icebreakers that you know you sit down and you learn about them you listen intently you, you know, you show empathy to them and you just, you know, you break bread, you sit down, you're spending time with someone. That's how you really learn someone and their culture. So, you know, I've had a lot of these moments and my, I guess I, that comes from my grandmother who, I don't know, every chef has a grandmother, right? And they have that story of their grandma. I do too. And she had me picking green beans on the back porch of Daytona beach, Florida at four or five years old, right? She would show me how to do it. And for my reward, she'd sit me on the counter and let me lick this, the whipped cream, uh, you know, uh, whip from the, the whipped cream that she was doing. So I felt like I was in heaven. Absolutely. I love some good whipped cream, especially off yep. the beater. Especially <laughs> a little bourbon with it too, right? A little bourbon whipped cream. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> well, since you brought up traveling, that's a big deal for us too here at the Cookbook Creative because we know that so many communities depend on tourists for their revenue, for their livelihood in this small community. And it's really fun, even for some of Texas's smaller local communities, we're doing some cookbooks around those. But I wonder when you're traveling, 
you know, if I'm just going to go travel, go to a place I've always wanted to go, how do you go about sort of learning the ropes and really getting that local experience? So you get the culture and you get the food and not not just in that case, the uh, the prepackaged tourist experience, but the authentic one. You know, it's a great question because um, I'm not I'm not big on tours or tour buses unless I'm in Japan because Japan is really amazing. Their tour buses are like Mercedes Benz. They're luxury. They have they have drinks on them. They have food. Uh, you can take the uh, uh, the express um, and you can go in deep into Japan and have a wonderful experience. My wife and I just came back from a two-week trip uh, to Spain, and then we went to Italy. So I really mapped, before we went, I really mapped out um, what I wanted, to, what we wanted to do, and um, without killing us financially. You know, it can be very expensive you're, if you're going to stay in a five-star hotel. We didn't do that. We, we went on a shoestring budget, but we really planned it like we planned it, and I, I I rented a car in both countries. So that was really an experience renting a car, especially in Italy, because I got to tell you, it was cr kind of crazy driving on the Amalfi Coast, okay, over these cliffs, okay, look at my hand, like 90 degree going down into the ocean and never coming back. And you got this much to get by a, a full service uh, luxury tourist bus, okay? So I gave I, I caved in. I said to my wife, you have to drive. Okay, let's come back to that. <laughs> and then we went to the toll booth and we didn't have enough of money to put in the toll booth. And so the arm didn't lift up. And we're sitting there with a thousand cars behind us, beeping their horn, people swearing at us. It was intense. And thank God some Italian man got out of his car, came to the window and said, I knew you were American put the quarter in the uh, thing and lift the arm lift up and we went on. These are little things you must know when you're going to rent a car in Italy or anywhere else in Europe. Okay. Because the insurance can be very expensive. And I prayed to God that I didn't get one scratch on that car in Italy. And guess what? It came back scratchless. Woo! So we do a lot of research on food, right? We don't want to, we don't want to spend a lot of money on food. Uh, we want to eat in the right places and get our get value for our money. So what do we look for? We look for the best pizza in Naples, right? We look for, uh, you know, we're big on prosciutto, you know, uh, ham. So we we uh, we love burrata cheese. We went to a burrata like factory um, north of of uh, of Naples. And this place, this place was spectacular. I mean, you know, we got we got the five star, uh, you know, uh, treatment. We we saw how burrata was made. They made yogurt. They made different sauces for for uh, pastries. It wasn't your typical, you know, market here in the U.S. It was five star, and it was just amazing. Um, Spain was really a lot of fun. We really mapped that out. We started in Barcelona. Hit some really great restaurants, El Chigre, El Chigre restaurant in Barcelona. Amazing food, excitement. The chefs are wild. It takes, you know, there's a two hour wait outside, but people from all over the world are there. It's fun. You know, those are the type of places we like to eat. So without, we went from Barcelona up to um, uh, the Jasper Grill. This is my favorite new grill now. Because it's a charbroil grill. Go on the website, Jasper. Okay. And we brought, we bought two of them for certified Angus beef, brought them back to our culinary center, and we used them for our annual conference in Las Vegas uh, last month. And we have the record now of cooking 70 tomahawks in two hours on the Jasper grill. <laughs> Absolutely. Cheers. That was good. Um, we made this kind of a religious experience too. So we went up to, we drove up to uh, uh, Lourdes, France, uh, and we saw, you know, the uh, apparition site. Um, then we came down to um, uh, our ultimate goal was go to a restaurant, Extabari. It's the third best restaurant in the world, and it really lived up to the billing. 
we had a 12 course meal that took five hours. We were in Basque country of, of Spain. Uh, it was a little village and you have to fly into Bilbao, Spain and drive 45 minutes into the mountains of, of, uh, uh, where the restaurant is. Wow. Uh, it was amazing. The, they, they pride themselves on the meat and, and their bread. So here's something that we, we found out is that the wheat, the flour is so much different um, because of the enzymes in France and Italy. It doesn't, it doesn't make you full. We ate so much bread. We don't, we're not bread eaters because, because we get so full of eating bread, right? Or right. pasta. We ate so much bread, and and I think it was because we walked a lot of places mm -hmm. too, and we walked it off and yeah. did the ten thousand steps. But we didn't. We weren't full, and we ate like a huge loaf of bread at this restaurant. It's like we tore it up, and um, it was it was just an amazing experience. So we did two weeks. We did one week in Spain. We got on a plane on a Sunday, and we hit Florence, Italy. So hit Florence, amazing. Um, you know, we hit, I have a friend there, a childhood friend. She met us there. She took us to a gelato making class right in the middle of Florence. So we learned how to make gelato with Anthony, you know, Anthony, he was really, really good. Anthony, he was very good. And, um, then she took us out to this Italian restaurant that her father has gone to. I'm telling you, we were, so, we were elbow to elbow. It was like an, ex an incredible experience. And then we spent the night. Um, we did a lot of of, of uh, Airbnbs. So that's the way to go in Italy and Spain. You don't have to stay, spend a lot of money in these five-star hotels. These Airbnbs are really first class. They usually serve breakfast and they'll do a little snack at uh, dinner time. And the, um, uh, the people who run them are lovely and that's their business. And so they're there greeting you and making sure you want to come back again one day. And that's we, where you get your your introductions to some of the great places locally too, right? Exactly, right. So we're not on anybody. And exactly, our landlord there uh, in Italy, we asked him, "Hey, what's the best? You know, what's the best panini sandwich down in Florence?" He gave, "Hey, don't go to that place where there's a line out the door and, you, and there's a line, a um, ten mile line. That is not the right place." He gave us the, the pl a name of a little uh, place. There was nobody there. Oh my God, the sandwich was magical. I mean, because these other places make the sandwich like this big, right? For five people, they made them individual. It was delicious, hand sliced on a, a deli sliced on a deli slicer, a perfect focaccia bread. Oh, it was amazing. Can you taste it? Can yes. you just taste it? Amazing. Oh. That was good. All right, so we we had the car. We We escaped Florence, thank God. And now we're on our way to see the world famous Dario Cecchini. So Dario Cecchini is the world's most famous butcher out of, out of Chianti, Italy. If you go on to Netflix, you can see him. Uh, his history is there. Um, he's married to an American wife. Uh, he's got a really cool business there. Uh, so we ended up first at his food truck, which oversaw. Uh, the vineyards of Chianti. And what do we stumble onto? A Harley Davidson international bike team, right? And they were lovely. We just we just kind of fit in and they were from Italy and they wanted to know who we were and blah, blah, blah. And we ordered this hamburger about this thick mm -hmm. and he made his own hot dogs and it was about an hour wait. We didn't care. They poured wine at the little uh, his little food truck uh, it was really first class. And then we headed up to our room, which his sister, Dario's sister runs. And uh, I guess the, the reason why I, I wanted to meet him was because I've heard so much about him. And he has a little butcher shop with about a 40 seat chef table uh, above the butcher shop. So we were, um, you know, we went to see him and he knew exactly who we were because we, we, we had we made connections I gave him a beautiful certified Angus beef Damascus steel knife. He loved it. We got pictures. So if you go on my Instagram, Chef Tony Biggs, 
go to my Instagram and look at these pictures, you'll see Dario Ciccini and such a nice guy. We headed up to the chef's table and we sat with different people from around the world, right? So it was kind of cool. And they, so this is like all meat, right? And this is another reason why I went. I wanted to see what he was doing and every course was meat. So if you can envision this long chef's table with about 30 people sitting at it, we had bread, we had olive oil, we had uh, crudite, carrot, celery, we had a little bit of dip, we had his homemade cannelli beans, right? Unbelievable, beautiful taste. And then here comes all the meat, a soup, all right? A, um, a steak tartare, uh, a round, a, a porterhouse, it just it just kept on coming. Dario came over. He sang a little bit to all of us. Uh, he, he was doing Dante, Dante. Um, uh, so he, you know, you, who couldn't love this guy, right? I mean, you know, he he was he was a, he he's the ultimate showman. I'm not. He was the ultimate showman. But I got some things out of him, and uh, that I'm using today. So I love it. I love the guy. I I I felt like. I, I think my only criticism of the whole meal was sometimes it was a little bit rare or raw, the meat. And this Italian side loved raw meat. We just asked him, can you cook this just a little bit more? I mean, I like rare, medium rare. Yeah. And I like medium steak because if you eat it too rare, the fat is not melting. The intermuscular fat mm -hmm. is not melting. We're going to come back to steaks, right? But yes. If it doesn't, the you know, the fat is not melting. How can you taste the beef? You're tasting raw beef, right? So you need to cook it about medium to medium rare so you taste those juices. And then we stayed in Naples. It was nice. We had like one of the, you know, we went to the greatest, they say it's the greatest pizzeria in the world. Okay, I liked it. Uh, it was good. Was it the best in the world? I've had better in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. I'll be honest with you. Okay, Patsy's, uh, Frank Pepe's. Uh, Modern, I liked it. I think it had more cheese, okay? But everybody says that's the best in the world. I'll, I'll, I'll vote on that, all right? If you say it, okay, I got it. Maybe it's me. But anyway, I've had some good pizza in America. And we, we, nailed, that, we nailed that trip in two weeks. But we did what we wanted to do. You know, we didn't, we didn't take a tour bus. And I guess that's good for some people. I'm not putting down the tour buses. That's good for some people. But we just like to get lost in, in the... In the neighborhoods too. Yeah, you know, it's just your travel style, and I, and I think it's mine too. That you just right. want to get off the beaten path and find something that every single person before you has not discovered already. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. With my job, it's been really incredible because um, I have traveled like all over the world with certified Angus beef. You know, I've been to Russia. I've been to Korea. I've been doing events uh, to promote the brand. Um, so I've been really blessed to see some some really cool places and uh, be down in the Red Square in Moscow or, you know, in, in, in uh, South Korea. Um, and I've been able to eat in a lot of really great restaurants and and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, that's I, I believe for young culinarians listening to this or anybody, I think you really have to travel it's a must you have to understand how, how food is really made i mean you know um and then you will you will have a better feel for it you know there's little secrets you know of, of these old grandmas who are making pasta or or uh, you know the middle eastern cuisine or, or asian you know they have these little secrets you got to find those little secrets right you got to find those little those little nuggets um and that's how you become i think uh, you know, a respectable chef. If you, if you, you, you're, you're, you're teaching yourself every day, you're learning every day, you know, about food. I, you know, I've been picking up cook. My first cookbook was from Jacques Pepin, La Technique, you know, it, 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 it was the first cookbook, uh, gourmet cookbook that had pictures. So, you know, it had pictures. And for me, that was, and for a lot of other people, that was huge back then in the 70s, right? Okay, wow, how to make a souffle, step by step by step. And so that's how you learn. And then failing is learning, right? Failing. 
If you fail at a recipe, you don't give up. You make it again and again and again and again and again, right? I, you know, I'm still trying to master a great pizza dough. I got a good one. I think I have a great one. But I don't think it's like Sally's or Frank Pepe's. There's something missing, you know? And I'm even making the poolish. So I'm 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 doing I'm doing all the right things, you know? But I I still I want to achieve that greatness in a pizza crust. I love pizza, right? So you can tell. I grew up in New England. Yeah. So I mean, that's one of the things that we love to make is pizza dough. Yeah. Well, and it's kind of that never ending to to your point about the travel and the experiences, it's that never ending curiosity. It's you you keep right. reaching for asking like, the next question and exploring. Kimchi is a good example, right? Kimchi. So, you know, I I in 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 social media has just you know this Elaine by it's just exploded with, you know, social media stars, cooks and um you know, and just regular housewives and grandmas cooking. And sometimes I go on there and I see some, you know, like a, there's a South Korean um, housewife and I watch her how to make kimchi. I mean, she's really good. You can do these things at home without having to go buy it or go to a restaurant. And, you know, you up your culinary uh, repertoire here, you know, you know, and then you can put your little spin on it, you know, so I think that's why I feel like I've been really successful at certified Angus beef because I think I've taken these classical, you know, I went to CIA, I worked my butt off for a bunch of chefs all my life. I learned classical cuisine. And then once you learn the basics of food, you can start innovating. But until you know those basics, and 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 just the simple like nuances of other cuisines, it's hard to go take that next step. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, the the learning just goes on and on. And there's always something you pick up from the Philippines that you can apply to your American recipe that's just a little bit different. And right. you learn to tonight, appreciate my, them. You know? Tonight my wife made gizadong. Ampalaya. Okay, what is that? What? Okay, what is it? Right? Like, I'm watching this, and I'm going, what? So bitter gourd is a very, is a green vegetable. You can really only find that in an Asian market. We have one in Cleveland. We, we buy it from there. It's extremely bitter. But she loves it. And it is an amazing medicine um, if you have diabetes. I learned from her. Wow. So it's bitter, bitter gourd. But this is a dish with bone marrow, a beef shank, scrambled eggs, garlic, onions, and the sautéed bitter gourd. Oh, I'm not a bitter gourd fan. It's too, it's too bitter. It's like extraordinarily bitter. but. This is like a delicacy in the Philippines. And so, mm. yeah, I, I learned a lot about Filipino food uh, uh, living there. And I, I have to say that uh, one night I went to this party and it was very, the lights were very, very dim and it was a buffet. And they said, oh, here, try this. And I thought, I thought this dish they were giving me was uh, a bowl of chocolate mousse. But what it was, is a dish called diaguan and it's pig blood cooked with, um, I'm going to give you my explanation of it with a little bit of calamansi, which is a very, very tiny lime that's grown in the Philippines, uh, chicharron, garlic, onions. And I wasn't ready for that. I wasn't ready for pig's blood. I, I, I was not ready, you know, time out. <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> And so I, I, there was, there was a lot of exotic foods in the Philippines and uh, in Southeast Asia that, you know, you really have, you have to require a taste for. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite certain that is accurate. So meanwhile, back at home where we have steak, 
Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit more about your role at Certified Angus Beef. Well, I'm the culinary director. Um, I've been with the brand for about 10 years now. Um, we have a we have about we have 150 great employees that work at Certified Angus. We're a marketing company, um, and uh, and we have a culinary center in Worcester, Ohio. And so people who is we're not open to the public. Um, so who comes to our culinary center are our partners who who you know use the brand, executive chefs, uh, restaurateurs, steakhouses, uh, barbecue, burger places, uh, five star hotels. So you name it, you know cruise ships, uh, cruise ship companies. So anybody that uses our brand um, will touch our culinary center at some point. And why is that? Because we are really good at what we're doing marketing. We help our partners, you know, finance, you know, financially make money on, on what they're doing. Um, and we come up with the best ideas for beef. We have an extraordinary chef team of six, six of us, uh, all has a different skill set. It's amazing. Um, and I've been with the brand. I think that why they hired me was with the international experience. And so um, I had a lot of that. And I really, I really, you know, I was, you know, it's funny because I was set in my own ways before I came to the brand food wise. And I learned that I, I picked up a book from Francis Malman. So if you haven't heard from him, another a Netflix, go on the Netflix, Chef's Table. Uh, look up Francis Malman. And this guy really kind of intrigued me because he was like a, you know, he was like a Michelin star chef in Europe. And he just kind of said, you know what, I'm going back to my roots. He's, he's German, but I think he has roots in Peru and Argentina and that, that area. And I'm going back to my roots and I'm going to cook with fire. And I was like, I got to be doing this. I have to be doing this this is what i this is what i wanted this is prehistoric this is the beginning of food how, how did you cook a buffalo okay you cooked them over a, a a fire pit right that's what we did right or whatever yeah. the other animal yeah that's what we did and so i had to do this and so i i i i have a friend that builds these insane like uh, Charasco barbecue grills down in Texas, down your way in Austin. And I would call him and we had a great relationship going on. Hey, can you build me this? Can you build me this? I want, I want to, I want to cook a side of beef on the, uh, on the shores of Maui, Hawaii. Yeah, I can do, I, I want a rotisserie grill. So he did it and we did it. <laughs> we just did it. We went, we took the, we took the rotisserie down to Maui and we put, a 300 pound a side of beef and we roasted it all day mm -hmm. and you would not believe the folks coming up that i met i met nfl stars i met people from all around the world they wanted a picture with me in that side of beef it was like that side of beef was a celebrity i mean <laughs> it just you know we go back to food you know the love of food captures everybody's imagination and that's how you can make a lot of friends and a lot of love and get to know people over food. Yeah. And by the way, when I cook for my friends, if they say, Hey, I want you to do a dinner for me, like blah, blah, blah. I'll pay you. No, no, you're my friend. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take any money. From you. Uh -huh. Now the ones I don't like, I charge them really. I charge them double. Charge them double. There you go. <laughs> Great minds. <laughs> I want to ask you, so what is, if, those friends who want you to cook for them, if they're asking you for advice on steak, what is the one thing people need to know about steak? Don't overcook it. That's blasphemy. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Don't overcook it. <laughs> Buy yourself a thermometer. Lane, do you have a thermometer? I do. do. You have a thermometer? Okay, I good. Use it all the time. You have a you have a certified Angus beef thermometer? You don't. I'm gonna no, send I do you one. not. All right. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Ribeyes, fillets, and strips, right? 
They're beautiful pieces of meat. They're beautiful cuts and they're expensive. You do not want to ruin your steak, do you? Do not. Do not. So this is my game plan for steak. I pick a nice cut. I make sure that my steak's about two and a half to two inches thick. Why? Because if, guess what? If I have somebody that's looking over my shoulder, taps me, once I have a conversation and I, I'm overcooking that steak, I have a little wiggle. I call it wiggle room. Wiggle room. Okay? So I always have that little wiggle room. I'm not going to cut a thin steak like that you're not going to taste the juiciness yeah the blood the you know the um um blood's going to run out of the steak you don't want that okay what you want to do is if you're cooking outside on your charcoal grill you get those charcoal very gray beautiful gray get them hot hot and gray right and you're going to put your steak on maybe 3 minutes Turn it, give it the nice, you know, grill marks. Uh, and, you you know, you, tr you get it sizzling hot. You turn it on the other side. Get the grill marks on it. Three to five minutes, depending on how you like it. Um, I kind of can do by touch now. You know, have you heard this method here, Elaine? Yeah. Yeah, but go for it if you want to share. The, the German, German chef taught me this when I was, I don't know, a young pup in culinary. But if you touch down here, that's rare. And if you go up to towards the thumb, it's more well done. So if you're touching that area, but I got away from that and I'm using a thermometer. I'm going to do my marking, cook them on both sides, the steak, maybe four minutes, five minutes, depending on how you like it, how you grill. Every grill is different too, by the way. You, you remove it and you let that steak rest, right? What is resting? You're resting that steak so all the juices can come back into form, right? Because if you cut it right away, all those juices are going to run out. You're going to have a miserable gray steak after. That's why you get that gray area. I usually put a piece of foil over the steak to let it, you know, uh, let it rest properly. And it's not cooking anymore. It's just keeping it warm. And I call that tinting. And tinting is not a city in China. It's a tenting is a city in Taiwan, but not China. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then I'm going to give my, I'm going to, uh, the, the, the big mistake people use with the thermometers is they go right down in the middle of it and they're touching the grill or the pan. So what is the tip of that thermometer going to read? 500 degrees, right? <laughs> 400 degrees, right? No, you do it from the side and you get the proper reading and make sure I take mine out about once it reaches 115 on my thermometer. I know that seems rare, but you're going to have what's called carryover cooking, right? So it's going to carry over to 120, 125. Ah, perfect. Stop, right? Take the thermometer out, let it rest five minutes for a big roast. Like a prime rib, you let it rest for 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, let that thing rest. Let that big thing, that big roast rest. The bigger the roast rest, the bigger the roast, the more you let it rest. The steaks, five, seven minutes, cover it with a tent. Beautiful. Let it rest. Put it on the side. Don't leak. Don't peek. Okay, let it rest. You're going to eat it soon. Okay. You serve that. Um, with a little bit of, you know, oh, I, I forgot the most important part, the salt and pepper. So I use kosher salt and what we call a dustless black pepper. It mm -hmm. just, it's a, it's a, it's not really coarse fine and it's not the, it's not the uh, butcher grind. So it's kind of in the middle of the road there. Okay. <clears throat> and I mix that together and I season my, over season my steak. I do because of what I learned is, just over season you can do it it's not it's not a big issue because you're going to cook that steak now i mean that is to me like the perfect steak and if you serve that with 
whatever your favorite sauce is, a red wine reduction or a Bernays sauce, or if you wanted to su sear that steak in a pan, which in the winter we do a lot of, <clears throat> because we don't want to grill outside, we don't want to go outside, whatever, you want to stay inside. So sear, you know, finish it with a little butter and uh, fresh rosemary and roasted garlic, baste all the time, baste, 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 baste. I will throw it in the oven just for a few minutes to let it, you know, get, you know, cooked. Um, take it out, take the temperature, same, let it rest and serve. Sounds delicious. Sounds delicious, right? Yeah. I've I've cooked, I've cooked, I think I've cooked meat at certified Angus beef a million different ways and at different cuts. And that's what has been really great and fun for me, you know taking uh, different cuts like, uh, you know, top butt and making that a roast. Or um, we, I came up with a, a, a really cool salad idea where you take the outside skirt steak, which is long, in length, very, very long, over 12 inches long, right? Well, if you cut strips out of that, right? Cut them down the middle. So you have like three strips, season it really good, grill it, and then once it comes off, you wrap your romaine leaves, and that's your Caesar salad. You pull that <laughs> up. Parmesan cheese, a little bit of olive oil, lemon juice, ch -ch 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 -ch. maybe some roasted potatoes around it. That's a different salad. Genius. Right? Genius. <clears throat> Take salad. So easy. Oh, I love that. Let's try something real quick. You okay. may think of, you know, as far as new things, let's do a speed round. And I'm just okay. going to ask you a question and you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? Okay. Ready. All right. Uh, what food do you never get tired of? Pizza. What's your favorite cookbook ever? Uh, I would say going back to, uh, I hate to say this, let Jacques Pepin, okay. La Technique. Excellent. Uh, what is the most underrated ingredient? An underrated ingredients, underrated ingredients. I don't think people use enough garlic. There's no Garlic's such not thing underrated. No I just don't thing. think they use enough of it. <laughs> no such thing as too much, let me say. All right. Let's see, last one. What kitchen gadget can you not live without? I hate to say this, but I have a rice cooker and a panini machine that I love. I can't live without those two gadgets. What I, are you I doing can't. with your rice cooker? You're just you're cooking the rice well, for I, well, I cooked the I cooked the I learned this from my wife because Filipinos always have the rice cooker on 24 seven. Right. So <laughs> I got to, I got to understand rice, you know, like, okay, put it in, let it go. You can walk away, come back in three hours. As a matter of fact, I got rice here ready for dinner after this show. So I can just leave it right there and just put your finger in there up to there with water and let it go. Yeah. Right. Wash it, wash all the talc off of it. So it's not going to get all sticky. And then you've got rice. Now you can use the rice the next day. She makes a garlic rice, crispy garlic. <clears throat> she fries up very slowly, throws the leftover rice in there. It's a whole different experience. Mm -hmm. And then my panini machine, you plug it in, takes five minutes to warm up. You want a really quick grilled cheese sandwich? Bam, good. I mean, we got all these pots and pans. We got all these little gadgets. We got, I got, you know, come on. You, you mentioned pitchforks. Okay. <laughs> but how many times did I do a pitchfork, right? Exactly. Pitchfork, pitchfork is for show. It's very situation specific. It's very situation specific. It is. Yes. Now that's when, that's when I get nuts. Yeah. That's <laughs> when I get nuts. As a matter of fact, I just invite, I invented a new dish, right? It's called edible charcoal, okay? <laughs> <laughs> edible charcoal. Uh, hold on, let me get my recipe here. Hold on a second. And uh, yeah, and so 
it's going to go along really good with uh, um, uh, with with my uh, beef, and and so I'm going to take a, a, there's a root vegetable out there, uh, a Chinese root vegetable, uh, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to cook it in charcoal, and mirin and wine. And it's going to get the charcoal color, okay? Yeah. Uh, the the daikon, and so I'm going to get I'm going to let it cook in there till it's you know fork tender, but leave it in there, and then it's going to look like charcoal when it comes out, and then throw it on the grill. A little salt, a little more charcoal seasoning on it, and so when you see it, it's going to be like a piece of charcoal. Well, and I'm about and to ask you if you want to share a recipe with us, but maybe not that one. <laughs> well, I'd not rather that share. I'm skeptical. Like, I, would right. rather, I would rather share a, a really good steak. You know how to cook the perfect steak with you. And yeah, I'd love going it. Back to the culinary, going about to the culinary center, we we teach folks how to uh, cook the perfect steak. We do, and um, we we also teach them the different. Um, you know, uh, different brands of beef like USDA versus certified Angus beef or certified Angus beef prime or, you know, um, another, uh, you know, another branded beef company. Uh, we well, I would love to share um, a will, good recipe. And... Yeah. and if you go to our website, certifiedangusbeef.com, there are a plethora of recipes. You can go right there. You can also go on to Roast Perfect app. If this is roasting season now, it's called Roast Perfect. Download it. It is amazing. We were just talking about it today. Um, and it's it's like it's 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 a lifesaver. Uh, let me pull it up. It's a lifesaver, right? Yeah. So that's that's the website. It's gonna come okay. on. It shows you how to do um any kind of roast from strip, you know, 101 strips to fillets uh to prime rib uh oh you always the, the question is well oh my gosh how many pounds should i get for how many people it's on there right that's the big question awesome. mark right for the consumer right um this is going to be very want, timely for the holidays coming up so it, it's very timely in the roast perfect app you can find out where to buy it certifying this beef you can find oh I've, I've got 20 people how much do i buy boom 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 put it in the put it in the app comes up done so what have i not asked you that i should have asked you i am writing a cookbook i know you and i talked a while back but i did get an agent well and... you've got a lot of stories to tell that probably makes good sense for you i I have it. I have an agent, and they were, yeah, they're excited, and so I think I told you what the concept was. It was a storybook cookbook. Yeah. So with each story, there's a recipe. Yeah. And I'm not gonna let out the bag. All I want you to do is follow me on Chef Tony Biggs Instagram, and when it comes out, you're gonna be really f having fun. <laughs> well, we will be looking forward to that, and we will certainly share when you get it ready. So, and I'll make well, sure everybody knows how to find you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And it was amazing tonight was, thank you very much for having me. I ah, really thank you. It. it was good to catch up with you and, and hear some of the behind the scenes stories. So we loved it. Thanks for being here. I'd love to do it again. It's an honor. <laughs>